Hello, and welcome uh, to the UCLA webinar. Um, feel free to ask questions on Twitter using hashtag UCLAMDChat uh, or comment on Facebook. My name is Juan Kim, and I'm a neurosurgeon in the UCLA Department of Neurosurgery. And today, our webinar is going to be regarding the treatment of brain metastases. Just a brief overview, um, I'll go over the background regarding what brain metastases are and some various treatment options. Then we'll discuss the, the evidence, clinical and scientific, behind the reason why we treat brain metastases the way we do. And then go over the UCLA paradigm for assessing, triaging, and treating patients with metastatic tumors to the brain to kind of demystify the process as it can be somewhat overwhelming and confusing sometimes. We'll go over some representative cases and at the end we'll answer some questions. So a little background. A brain metastasis is any tumor within the brain that originates from a cancer elsewhere in the body. So in order of decreasing frequency, most often we see lung tumors and then breast, melanoma, renal cell, and colorectal cancers. Sometimes the cancers, by the time they get to the brain, have become malignant enough that there's no real good differentiation of the tissue, so it's unknown where they come from. About 20 to 50 percent of patients with cancer develop brain metastases at some point during their treatment, and with 170,000 cases per year and 100,000 deaths per year from brain mets, it's a very significant um, tumor population that we see within neurosurgery. Brain metastases can present in a variety of ways. They can have focal neurologic symptoms, such as weakness, numbness, tingling, and visual symptoms. Or they can present with more vague symptoms, such as headaches, nausea, vomiting, and blurry vision. And oftentimes, these symptoms are more associated with increased brain pressure from the swelling associated with the brain metastasis, as well as just the local uh, mass effect or pressure that the brain metastasis may uh, cause. In addition, there may be personality changes or changes in memory and affect, and this might be related to pressure on the memory circuits or the limbic circuits. Um, in addition, if the metastasis causes irritation of the brain or sometimes the metastasis can even bleed, um, they can cause seizures as well as a presenting symptom. A few quick definitions um, regarding the discussion of brain metastasis. A solitary brain metastasis is one single or is one brain metastasis with no ev evidence of metastatic disease. <clears throat> now this is an MRI of the brain. It's an axial cut, so the images are taken in this plane. And this is as if the patient is in the scanner, head over there, feet towards you. So the eyes are up. So this is the right side of the brain. That's the left side of the brain, and that's kind of the convention for radiology. And as you can see, there's a very um, circumscribed enhancing lesion here in the parietal lobe. And it's just one single lesion, and so we call this a solitary brain metastasis. Now if you take this same scan and say that there was systemic disease elsewhere, then it would be a single brain metastasis rather than a solitary brain metastasis. So the distinction is whether or not there's significant systemic metastatic disease. Oligometastatic disease is when you have a few brain metastases in one or more organ systems. So in this case, you can see another axial contrasted MRI of the brain with two enhancing lesions um, within the brain itself, and maybe there's one or two more elsewhere in either the lung or the liver, and this would be an oligometastatic disease state. <coughs> Leptomeningeal disease is when you have metastatic disease within the cerebral spinal fluid of the brain and spinal cord itself. So in this contrasted uh, MRI of the brain, you can see that within the sulci or the crevices of the brain, you have this faint linear enhancement. And that's when tumor cells get into the cerebral spinal fluid and get into the nooks and crannies of the brain itself. As far as treatment options for brain metastases, we have, primarily speaking, four major treatment options. Craniotomy and tumor resection is what we typically think of when we think of neurosurgery, and that's when the patient is under general anesthesia. We use neuronavigation in order to determine where the tumor is exactly, uh, make a skin incision, open a small window of bone, and take out the tumor. The big thing for a craniotomy and resection is that we typically try to take it out in one piece or on block, and the reason why this is important for brain metastases in particular is that by doing so, we limit we not only ensure that we take out the whole thing, but we limit 
small micro seeding or spread of the tumor, which could happen if you have to take it out piecemeal. Obviously, this is not always possible, particularly with larger tumors or tumor vision sensitive areas, but this is our goal most of the time. Radiation therapy is one of the foundations of the treatment of uh, metastatic disease to the brain. The way we deliver radiation is primarily in three different forms. Uh, we have stereotactic radiosurgery and stereotactic radiotherapy. Stereotactic means with great precision um, and accuracy and localization. And with stereotactic radiosurgery, that's when the number of fractions or the number of doses that we deliver are anywhere from one to five. So SRS, one to five doses delivered. <coughs> stereotactic radiotherapy is when we're delivering more than five fractions. Um, and it can be up to 30 fractions, for example. And this is when the tumor is um, either on the larger side uh, or if it's near very, very sensitive areas that we can damage if we deliver it all the radiation in a single dose. Um, so for those reasons, if it's near critical structures or the tumors are larger, we start splitting up the doses of radiation. Whole brain radio th radiation therapy is when we're treating the whole brain in its entirety with a large field with small fractionated doses. And this is if you have very diffuse metastatic disease or leptomeningeal disease that is um, advanced enough that you can't target every single lesion and you need to treat the brain in its entirety. When we talk radiation therapy, oftentimes you'll hear a lot of terms being thrown around, gamma knife, cyber knife, proton beam, novalis. And all these terms are essentially uh, brand names with slight differences in the technology, but essentially achieving the same thing. Gamma knife is delivering gamma rays. Uh, linear accelerator deals with photons, and proton beam is protons. But they ultimately all deliver very focused radiation um, to the tumor within the brain. These are images illustrating the different technologies. We have the gamma knife perfection up there, the cyber knife over there, the linear accelerator novalis over here, which is what we have at UCLA, and then the proton beam over here. <coughs> In radiation therapy, like I mentioned, it's very important that we deliver very focused millimeter accuracy doses of radiation. As such, it's very important that the patient lies completely still during the delivery of the radiation. Traditionally, we used a Lexel frame, um, which required a neurosurgeon to actually screw in bolts and pins into the patient's skull um, prior to the delivery of radiation. Nowadays, we've moved more towards conformal thermoplastic masks, which are custom patient-specific masks that are made by taking very fine-cut CTs of the patient's head and face and then having that mold onto the patient's face and keep them very still during the radiation delivery. If the patient's claustrophobic, we can cut out little holes in the eyes and nose without any diminishing of the accuracy. Third, we have laser interstitial thermal therapy as far as the treatment option. And this is when we stereotactically, either using a frame or neuronavigation, place a laser fiber within the tumor itself and then using real-time thermal MR imaging, ablate the tumor by delivering uh, thermal energy to the tumor um, while in the MR suite. And I'll speak more of this a little bit later. This is uh, some pictures illustrating the setup for uh, uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy. And here you can see that this is a skull anchor um, with a bolt and a laser fiber coming out. And this is all very small. This is probably about a centimeter and a half um, in diameter at most. And the incision for these is probably about three millimeters. <coughs> Intrathecal chemotherapy is when patients have uh, leptomeningeal disease typically, and this is delivered um, into the cerebral spinal fluid or the, the brain fluid through an amyo reservoir that is placed under the skin, <coughs> excuse me, and then connected with a catheter that goes into the ventricle or the fluid body um, located uh, near the center of the brain. By delivering the chemotherapy into the Amaya Reservoir, we're able to deliver the chemotherapy into the CSF space and treat those tumors that have infiltrated the CSF space in patients with leptomeningeal disease. <coughs> so at UCLA and many other large academic ne uh, neurosurgery centers, 
we like to do everything based on um, evidence. And the treatment for neuros, um, brain metastasis in regards um, to craniotomy and adjuvant radiation is probably one of the strongest bodies of evidence that we have um, in the treatment of brain metastases. Patchell and his landmark studies in 1990 and 1998 demonstrated that surgery for a brain met followed by whole brain radiation therapy, which is the modality of choice at the time, um, as stereotactic radiosurgery wasn't re readily available. By doing that, it's better than biopsy alone with radiation or surgery alone without radiation. From there, through various iterative um, advances and studies, we found that radiosurgery plus or minus resection is better than surgery followed by post-op whole brain radiation and re in terms of overall survival and functional status. Additionally, craniotomy plus stereotactic radiosurgery is better than radiosurgery alone for tumors greater than two centimeters. So we're gradually taking these steps that keep um, having this mounting body of evidence that radio, or sorry, that surgery for an accessible brain tumor followed by focused radiation is really the way to go in order to have the best local control and overall survival. In addition, to address the prior studies that were based on whole brain radiation, more and more studies have demonstrated that SRS, to just treat the area of the lesion itself rather than the whole brain, is better for functional status and comparable as far as con tumor control. Chang and Sofietti demonstrated that whole brain radiation leads to decreased recall and quality of life at four to six months um, compared to radiosurgery to the, just the lesion in, or post-surgical resection cavity. And then finally, Yamamoto in 2014 demonstrated that um, through a multicenter study that SRS for up to 10 metastatic brain tumors is just as equivalent um, as if the patient only had one or two brain tumors, showing that you can do radiosurgery for patients up to um, 10 metastatic lesions. And then finally, interstitial thermal therapy via laser. Um, it's still a relatively new technology, but we're showing that even pa patients with brain metastases that fail standard of care, we can get a 93% tumor control rate um, with laser interstitial thermal therapy. For intrathecal chemotherapy, the evidence is still mixed as far as the reservoirs go um, in the delivery of chemotherapy into the cerebral spinal fluid um, space. And as such, we do this on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. So the UCLA paradigm, every week we meet with a radiosurgery tumor board that consists of, consists of neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, and neuroradiologists. Um, we discuss newly diagnosed brain tumors um, and newly diagnosed metastatic tumors and decide what the optimal treatment um, paradigm would be for each patient based on location and number of metastases, systemic disease, and medical com comorbidities. All right, next slide. So this is kind of the UCLA paradigm that we have here <coughs> um, as illustrated. So once a patient is diagnosed with an intracranial brain metastasis, uh, if the patient has more than 10 metastatic lesions or leptomeningeal disease, he would be a candidate for uh, he or she would be a candidate for whole brain radiation therapy. We would follow with serial imaging, and if we're able to achieve tumor control, continue getting serial MRIs. If one or more of the lesions fail um, the whole brain radiation and continue to grow, we can potentially treat it with focused radiation just to the lesions that have failed treatment and um, monitor the other lesions. If the lesions themselves still continue to grow despite focused radiation, then we can give um, laser ablation to the lesion. For patients that present with less than 10 metastases, we can offer them either surgery and radiosurgery or stereotactic radiosurgery alone. The patients that are more favorable candidates for surgery plus stereotactic radiosurgery are the ones that have a large tumor that is pressing on certain areas of the brain that cause them to be symptomatic, um, either through weakness or speech difficulties. Um, the other criteria that would make them more of a surgical candidate is if the tumors come closer to the surface and are in locations that aren't um, eloquent, so in areas that 
if we were to go in there and dissect the tumor away from the brain tissue, we wouldn't cause more harm than good. And then also, if there's no clear primary, so we don't have a source for where the, the tumor is coming from, then we may want to go in um, in order to determine a tissue diagnosis. If the patient's um, are poor surgical candidates for medical reasons, have small asymptomatic lesions, or have lesions that are very deep within the brain, where accessing them surgically would cause more harm than good, then we may favor doing stereotactic radiosurgery by itself without open surgery. These patients we would also follow with serial imaging, and then if they had lesions that grew um, despite um, this initial paradigm, then we may offer laser ablation as well. Next slide. So case one, newly diagnosed single brain metastasis in a patient with a history of breast cancer. Next. So this patient, um, as we um, stated before, is an MRI with contrast, an axial cut, um, head over there, feet towards me, right side, left side. So this patient has an enhancing lesion that's about three centimeters in the right parietal lobe. Um, in addition to that, there's a significant amount of edema or swelling in the brain caused by this lesion, and it's causing what we call uncle herniation, or basically normal aspects of the brain to herniate or start pressing on the brain stem and distorting it, which can cause sleepiness, and if it goes long enough, strokes and even death. Next slide. So for this patient, next slide, um, we have a patient with less than 10 intracranial metastases, next. Um, with a very large superficial uh, lesion causing mass effect and um, neurologic deficit uh, in the way of, can you go back? All right. And because of that, we offer this patient resection and uh, surgery. Next. And this MRI demonstrates uh, resection of the lesion, and you can always already see that the brain is starting to come back and um, fill the area where the tumor used to be. And then the normal morphology of the brain stem is starting to return at, now that the pressure has been removed. Next. Case number two is a deep-seated single metastasis that failed uh, radiosurgery. Next. And this is a patient with a lung metastatic lesion um, that's within the thalamus, which is a very deep part of the brain and is critical for communicating signals from the brain itself to the rest of the body. He was offered radiosurgery and the lesion started to grow despite that. And so, next. Given this, next. Uh, we have a single intracranial metastasis, next, that underwent SRS alone. And then um, we got serial imaging, next, and it failed uh, tumor control, so we offered him laser ablation. Next. This is the setup, and it demonstrates um, our laser ablation setup. Uh, we have the bone anchor right here, about a three millimeter incision, and a stereotactic navigation uh, where we're taking a biopsy of the lesion uh, to see if this is truly recurrent tumor or radiation effect, which can sometimes happen after stereotactic radiosurgery. Next. This is us securing the laser, next. And this is um, us inserting a laser within the trajectory that was pre-planned, next. This is the patient now in the um, MR suite, next. And as we turn the laser on, we set safety margins so that as the tissue is ablated, we can ensure that we are not damaging the normal um, parts of the brain surrounding the lesion itself, next. This is an intraoperative um, image demonstrating the laser fiber within the lesion itself. Next. And this is an intraoperative MRI which shows good ablation of the lesion. Um, as you can see, this is uh, this black area right here is the laser fiber and the surrounding enhancement is the actual um, rim of the limit of the ablation that took place. Next slide. We did a one month follow-up post-op and show stable um, ablation of the lesion. Next and uh, four months it looked very similar, next. And then at 11 months you can see that the lesion's starting to involute on itself um, now that it's been destroyed, next. Case three is a recurrence um, following, a uh, recurrence of a brain metastasis following prior craniotomy and radiosurgery, next. And we can see here, this is an axial cut, so again like this, and this is 
um, recurrence of the brain metastasis following the, the radio surgery um, and prior resection. And this is the resection cavity. And as you can see, this is the dark area. This is a coronal slice now, as if you're looking face on. This is a coronal section where you can see the res prior resection cavity. And at the bottom, you see what's concerning for recurrent metastatic disease. Next slide. So this patient had less than one metastasis. Next. Um, we offered surgery and radio surgery. Next. And despite that, next, we had treatment failure, so we offered laser ablation. Next. Now this is a dynamic GIF image, um, which shows what we see when we're doing the laser ablation in the OR. This is the initial setup, and after we have the radio, uh, the laser fiber replaced, we have these color maps that demonstrate how hot the tissue is getting as we turn the laser on. We set safety margins so that once the heat of these uh, surrounding tissue get to a certain point, the laser will turn off automatically so we preserve the normal tissue and only destroy the tumor tissue. This is us turning the laser on. As you can get see, the lesion is getting hotter and hotter. And the orange um, illustrates the, the areas that are being permanently destroyed. Next. This is an intraoperative uh, MRI, which demonstrates that we have the nice halos um, surrounding where the two laser fibers, in this case, were placed. And the patient did well with uh, no recurrence of her disease. Next. Case four is a large symptomatic metastasis with multiple brain metastases. Next. So in this case, again, an axial contrasted MRI. Um, this is the right side of the brain, and we see this large six centimeter um, brain lesion right here. But this patient also had multiple other brain metastases. Even though there are multiple metastases, this right frontal lesion is causing a significant amount of swelling. There's all this dark area right here is swelling. And what we call right to left midline shift. So it's pushing all the normal brain structures over. And if this goes on too long, it can cause strokes, herniation like we talked about, or pressure on um, very critical brain structures such as the midbrain, and even death. So we offer this patient craniotomy to remove this large lesion and radiation treatment for the other ones. Next slide. So again, less than 10 um, lesions. Next. Um, we offered surgery in uh, SRS. Next. Next slide. And this is a post-operative film, and you can see that the brain's already starting to shift over more, and the amount of edema is starting to reduce as well. Next. So why UCLA? So the treatment of brain metastasis is not a single discipline approach. It's multidisciplinary, and as such, we need the best in every field, M much akin to a marriage where you're not just entering a family, but or not just entering a partnership, but a family and sometimes a whole village. When you come to UCLA, you have the experts in neurosurgery, radiation oncology, solid oncology, and cancer research um, all coming to the table. Next. This is um, kind of a montage of our team consisting of neurosurgeons, uh, oncologists, uh, radiation oncologists, and neuroradiologists who discuss frequently on a weekly basis in order to help um, create the best paradigms of treatment for each individual patient. Next. In addition to that, and our multidisciplinary tumor boards, our use of a thermal um, plastic mask, um, one particular advancement in um, Radio surgery that I'm particularly excited about is our multi-met radiosurgical planning. Next. Um, typically, when we <clears throat> treat metastatic disease uh, within the brain with radio surgery, um, each met or two close mets are kind of considered one target that the physicist has to plan around. And as such, if, for example, using traditional methods that have been used up until even a year ago, if we were to treat seven metastatic lesions, it would probably take um, on the order of about three hours of on-the-table time with the thermoplastic mass in two sessions for the patient. So that's about six to seven hours um, to treat about seven metastatic lesions. With the new multi-met neurosurgical planning next, we can look at each one of these lesions kind of as a whole um, collective and create hotspots for each one while monitoring exactly how much radiation the um, adjacent tissue gets. Next. 
and in doing so, um, create a whole dynamic plan for the brain um, in, instead of individual metastatic lesions. And in doing so, we can treat seven METs, for example, with a single dose of radiation in 45 minutes rather than two sessions of three hours each. Next. Additionally, um, at UCLA, through our oncologists and neurosurgeons, we have multiple clinical trials and tumor research. Uh, we're currently trying to roll out uh, a trial for neoadjuvant radiosurgery where we'll look at treating the tumor up front um, prior to resection as there's mounting evidence that demonstrates that by doing so, you limit the spread of tumor following these open surgeries. We're constantly banking our tumors and studying them for their molecular markers in order to better understand them and tailor our chemotherapies and targeted therapies. And then our oncologists have multiple clinical trials that look at individualized um, tumor marker therapies that can activate or deactivate the immune system accordingly um, and target um, molecular uh, parts of these brain metastases. Next. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues within neurosurgery and neuro-oncology um, and for their help with uh, these slides. Next. And um, I believe that we have questions now from Twitter and Facebook. Thank you. <coughs> All right. So the first question is, how long is it between craniotomy and postoperative radiosurgery? So typically, after a resection of a large metastatic tumor, the brain starts to fall in on itself because the brain is actually very soft, um, despite what you might see on um, NCIS. It ha kind of has the consistency of uh, tofu, if you will. And after the tumor comes out, the brain collapses, so we like to get a uh, post-operative MRI scan at about a month to see where the brain has finally settled and then we perform radiosurgery um, on that final scan. Um, is there any way to prevent brain metastases? Any daily lifestyle factors that are known? That's a good question. I don't think that there's a particular lifestyle factor per se that can limit the amount of um, metastatic lesions that go to the brain. Um, I it's one of those things where controlling the systemic disease is really the best way to limit any spread of the disease that would potentially go elsewhere, including the brain. And then finally, is there any significant hair loss after post-operative radiosurgery? Um, I would say that because the number of doses and the amount of radiation um, that is delivered is very focused, uh, there's very minimal, if any, hair loss. So that's not a great concern. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar. And please feel free to continue commenting on Twitter using UCLA MD Chat or Facebook. Thank you. <laughs>